Well, um, the vast majority of people, this is, first of all, this is a talk about Varnankar, the ancient science of out of body soul projection. The vast majority of people, um, that I encounter, or should I say that listen to the, um, to YouTube, that read books, etc., etc., are um, not ready. They're the unready souls. They're not ready for the ancient science of out of body soul projection. It's, and this is just the way it is. I've been doing this for a few years now. It's always been this way that most of the masses don't truly want truth and they don't truly want God. And so it takes a very brave individual to be able to go forward into these various worlds and planes and actually soul travel or move in consciousness into these expanded states of awareness. It takes someone who um, is bold, cunning, adventurous, courageous. Now... There has to be a degree of humility in general um, at the same time. And one has to empty their cup of all that they think they know. Because, frankly, um, Vardenkar, the ancient science of soul projection, is completely... It's a different area than the other paths, the religions, the metaphysical systems, the mystery schools, these paths that I mentioned before, these are the paths of karma and reincarnation for the most part. Vardenkar doesn't hold itself as the only path back to God, but it holds itself as the most direct, the fastest path back to God. And this is the underlying difference. Now, the masses aren't interested really in truth. They're interested in the material, the things of this world, the emotions, um, the, the outer manifestations, um, cosmic consciousness. The masses simply are not ready for truth. They don't want truth. They don't think they need truth. And a true um, master will never push what he has on anyone. If somebody doesn't want it, they're certainly entitled to um, to not having it pushed on them or, or anything like that. So this is very important. A, a true master will not interfere with your present state of consciousness without your permission. And consciousness is what this is all about. Awareness and consciousness. Now, one of the first things the individual encounters is they find that truth is incredibly simple, but it's nothing like what they thought it was. Or maybe they, they did um, stumble upon it. But if most people stumble upon truth, they generally don't recognize it because it's so humble. There's so much to these universal works, but the basic premise, which is a science, the science of out-of-body soul projection, is that the individual, and it's always about the individual, it's not about the group, it's not about the organization, but the individual can, through their own volition, practice these spiritual exercises, which are only taught to members of this, this elite group, and they can leave their body and experience these various eliminated states of consciousness. By following the Varden, which is the Holy Spirit, it shows itself as this light and sound. 
when one is on the path, the true path, they are certain ingredients that are needed in order to complete, to to move into this journey. Uh, the individual goes through the various lower planes, the physical plane, the astral plane, the causal plane, the mental plane, the etheric plane, which is the high mind, and crosses into what's known as the void, which is a barrier between the lower worlds of time and space, matter and energy, and the higher worlds, which is the soul plane and beyond, which are the pure positive God worlds. Now, this sounds simple, but to go through this process um, and to establish oneself in these higher states so that they become a permanent resident and they're able to operate basically have their consciousness in the higher planes while operating in the lower worlds using the lower bodies as vehicles is um, extremely difficult but it can be done and can be done through this ancient science of out of body soul projection now truth is an interesting thing uh, nobody really owns truth but all paths are offshoots of, of spirit, which is the Varden. They're offshoots of this Varden. And so there will be pieces and shards of truth in all of these different paths, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, um, you name it. There's some shards of this truth. The problem is that it's not complete. So the individual struggle for many lifetimes, millions of lifetimes, looking for answers and getting lost in what we call Maya or illusion. And so this process can can go on and on and on for millions of lifetimes. Now, this is obviously something that may appear very cruel. Um you know, people say, well, if, if God is love, why would God allow this sort of thing to continue on and on and on? Well, it's an interesting answer to that question. What it comes down to is that we have a choice. God, or what we call the Huri and Vardenkar, has given us an opportunity to go directly to it via the path of Vardagar, via the path of bilocation, and to experience these elevated states of consciousness and eventually go past self-realization, which is the soul plane, the fifth plane, the first of the pure positive God worlds, and go through these various planes and eventually reach the state of God realization, or what you, I guess you could call it perfection, although there's always another plane, there's always an, a higher state, you see. But this has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with the things of this world. And this is the part that really trips a lot of people up. And this is why man worships his space gods, his gods of matter, energy, time, and space. It's interesting, you hear the story of Jesus, and one of the big selling points of Jesus was that he multiplied fish, he made a blind man see, you know, allegedly. Um, he turned water into wine, etc., etc. In other words, he produced these manifestations or so-called miracles. And this was a big deal for a lot of people because they're worshiping this space god. And frankly, they want to see the miracles in their own lives. They want more money. They want better health. They want more prosperity. They want the things of this world, but they don't really want God. They want the miracles that they believe that God will give them if they can have a relationship with God, that this will lead to their ultimate betterment in the lower states. Well, if you know anything about this, God doesn't really care 
whether we drive an expensive Cadillac or whether we take the bus. I mean, all these things compared to the universal plan are really not very significant. You know, why God would care what kind of car we drive is, is beside me. But this is the average person that is very materialistic. Now, some people worship emotions. Um, some people are what you call, I guess, the the do-gooders of the world. And I suppose you could say this is a higher state. And they will go out and they will feed children and they will do these various charity tasks and all of this uh, involving human love, karmic love. Uh, this is certainly um, commendable of them. And um, it shows a certain love. But this will not bring one to God either. What this will do is create good karma so that when one incarnates, their conditions can improve upon this world or whatever world they come to. Now, there are various levels of, of these planes. Um, and a lot of people are, are very confused because, frankly, um, the leaders of these various churches and groups don't know what they're talking about. It's like the old saying, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And so people are very confused, and there's all this misinformation. I've talked about this before, but that's not really the point that I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make, I suppose, or part of it is, that we have to experience God. We Not in the emotions... Not physically, you know, seeing water turning to wine or seeing um, these miracles in our physical life. I mean, that's fine. We don't reject any of that if it happens. We're grateful. But that's not enough. That is simply uh, worshiping a, a material God, worshiping a space God. See, this is God doesn't really care about that. We can do that all we want. And we're still going to get old. We're still going to die. And we're going to reincarnate again and again and again. We may go to a lesser heaven, such as the astral plane. But we're still in the lower worlds. We're still trapped in this time and space. We still haven't found the true Godhead. Still haven't reached self-realization. Still haven't reached God-realization. So all of these material things, whether they're materiality at the physical level or the emotional level or the, the astral plane and it goes up into the mental plane well, the causal and mental where we have these um each plane gets more refined and there's less matter and more spirit you see but the confusion comes um when we're not able to clearly leave our body and travel into the golden wisdom temples and have our own experiences with this light and sound. Now, the light and sound is the Varden or the Holy Spirit. Now, this light and sound is very, very important. And there's two waves. There's the descending wave which sust which creates and sustains all of creation and it goes down it goes from the godhead all the way down into the various planes and as it flows it lowers in vibration vibratory rate and it manifests all of these worlds and sustains them and then there's the returning wave as this wave descends into the various planes, and these are actual planes, these are worlds, with beings on them, they're more real than the physical, um, we can experience these things. We can actually have the experience of this. And it, it descends down, and when it reaches the bottom, which is the physical, um, pretty much, it, like a radio beacon coming down from a tower, it hits the ground, it hits the bottom, and then it, it returns up again. It flows up, like the shape of a U, 
and it moves through the various planes higher and higher. And as it goes up in, in vibration, there's less and less matter. And finally, it, it reaches into the soul plane, which is the first of the pure positive God worlds, and it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that into the various, the sixth plane, the seventh plane. You know, at this point, Alealog, the Alealog, Hukukatlog, Agamlog, Anamilog, and so on. And this is extremely important. This link up with the returning wave. Now, doing these spiritual exercises, we find that we're entering an entirely different system. We find that the system that we were on before is the system of karma and reincarnation, where we create karma, whether it's positive or negative, and there are accounts, there are karmic accounts that are kept. And people have mostly the scriptures of the various groups and metaphysicians and spiritual, so-called spiritualists, they'll talk about angels and they'll talk about demons and they'll talk about all these different things. These are like the workers that work in the lower worlds to administer they're basically, it's like being in a prison or being in a school system. And their job, especially the the Kalnaranjan, which is the king of the negative power, its job is to keep soul down here as long as possible so that it can gain more and 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 more experiences lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, working out karma and creating karma and working out more karma and creating more karma. And so what we think of as love actually is karma. And so we'll meet an individual and maybe we have a, there's a war going on and we end up striking that person down with our sword, you know, in the heat of battle. And the next thing you know, maybe we put a little too much hate into that blow for whatever reason. And the next thing you know, in another lifetime, we're married to that person. And we've got to learn to love them. And or we hate them. And we have an antagonistic relationship with them. And so all these plays of karma, you know, maybe we cut off someone's arm. Or they lose an arm in battle. And now we end up losing an arm or a leg or some other limb. Or going through some hardship. Or we perhaps we give a tremendous amount of charity to somebody, a child, somebody who's hard on their luck, and we feed them and keep them warm and we take care of them. Maybe they're sick, and we give them care and love. And then in the next life or a life soon following, all of a sudden our luck is on the downside, and we get to experience what it's like to receive that, you see? And so these are the plays of Maya, or illusion, the plays of karma. And as we go through this, we're, we're learning various lessons and more lessons and more lessons. And this goes on over millions of lifetimes. It's almost crazy. And this goes through various cycles, you see. These different cycles. Some of the cycles are very beautiful the earth is a paradise or the whatever planet we're on at the time is an absolute paradise and there's no wars and this is a perhaps a golden age or a silver age and we move from the golden age to the silver age to the bronze age and finally the we're in it now the beginning of the iron age which is the worst of all it's the most negative of all you see and this is the play of maya the play of karma and reincarnation and we have various religions and we have various systems in place and philosophies and we learn different things and how to be better and how to be good and how, you know, all this stuff. And we study in mystery schools and we study all these different things, learn all these different lessons, and it's a very slow path. It's the path of pain. Now, there'll be times when things will be very pleasant and happy 
and other times when things will be absolutely um, wretched and difficult. And one has to understand that in the lower worlds, we have duality. We have positive and negative. You see? Now, Buddha talked about the middle path. We're not Buddhists. But, see, that's not really the key either. Um, but we go through these, these various um, cycles... And so life seems really pleasant, and then life seems very hard, and of course everything in the middle. And we go through these things, and people jump from one to the other, and various interests that soul goes through, dancing, music, pottery, toiling, laboring, farming, some of these things are feel forced upon um, because of circumstances, because of karma again. And one man is a king, and then he abuses his subjects, and then the next thing you know, he's being abused by somebody else, and he's angry and upset, and he gets to experience what he did to these other people. And it just goes on and on and on and on, and people learn lessons, and they learn to love one another, and hate one another, and kill one another, and heal one another. And it reaches a point where you say, like I had said before, well, wait a minute. What you know? What what's going on here? What where's the love? If if we are we are soul, we're an eternal spark of God. We we are eternal beings. Soul exists because God loves it so. So where's the love? Why why am I trapped in this wheel of eighty four in this constant karmic cycle? And the angels come and all these different entities and the lords of karma, and everything is tracked, and we keep coming back and back and back and back, and once in a while we get to go to a higher plane, slightly higher, and then we think we're in heaven, but we're not really in heaven. We're just in another plane, and then we come back down again, and this goes on and on, and it's like, why? Where's the love? Where's God? You know, what? what's going on? This doesn't seem uh, very fair. It doesn't seem very humane. And of course, when we translate or, or physically die, the physical body dies, or it could be the astral body dies, um, we lose, most of us lose memory of this. You know, we have a new brain, new body. And so we, ha we live one life at a time, which is actually very humane if you think about it. So where, you know, where... Like I was saying before, like what what's going on here? What why would this be so cruel or seemingly cruel? The irony of this is that there is a way out of this, and this way um, is to God cannot descend into the human body into the lower states of consciousness. We have to raise our awareness into these higher states. Now, we can't do this by sitting around waiting for that to happen. We can sit in meditation for days, weeks, months, years, and people have tried this, and it's generally, a, it's a dismal failure. It has to be an active approach. This is a very difficult journey because there's all of this resistance. And so it takes a system that you're dealing with vibration, you're dealing with consciousness. And so we're getting back to that light and sound, that returning wave. Now, in order for the spiritual student, the chila, to reach these higher states, it's much easier to do it with a master. It's very, very difficult to do it without a master. It's, it's virtually impossible. Um, you know, I mean, would you learn to, you know, would you try to learn to play the violin without any books or any teachers? Um, and that's easy. It's, I used to play the violin. It's, very, it's easy compared to this. So, 
but you can't just run out and get any master because the problem is a master or a teacher can, or a guru, or whatever you want to call that person, whatever you want to label it, can only take you to whatever plane they've established themselves upon. So if you have a, a guru that's only reached the astral plane or the causal plane, that's as high as he's ever going to take you is the causal plane or the astral plane or wherever he's earned. Now, the guru may say, oh, I'm self-realized, or oh, I'm God-realized. Well, that doesn't mean he is. He might think he is, or he might be lying. So, you know, pick your pick your path, obviously. Like I said, a master will never interfere with another state of consciousness without their permission. So it's a difficult journey, but it's really has to be active and only the bold and adventurous and the cunning and courageous will be able to, to make this journey that doesn't mean on the outer world you're that way because you might be quiet and so forth but on the inner it takes a tremendous amount of love for God it takes a desire that's greater for the for God than it is for the things of this world and the emotions and, and all of the trappings that come down here. Because frankly, you know, we're talking about, isn't that cruel? Frankly, to be honest with you, we do it to ourselves. We actually choose. We choose to incarnate, which sounds really insane. And uh, sometimes I have conversations with my wife Heather G, who was a Varden master, very good one, and uh, we just look at each other like, you know, it just seems really crazy. Some people just seem really crazy. They're afraid to leave their body, but they're not, but they don't realize that the states of consciousness beyond, you know, beyond the lower worlds are absolutely beyond description. These, the lower worlds are not our true home. They're not. But we've been fooled from being here so long. Most people are fooled into thinking that this is it. And then they set up all these goals. You know, I want to be richer. I want to be happier. I want to do this. I want to do that. And so they trap themselves in a sense. Now, the cow or the negative power, some people call it Satan, whatever you want to call it, it has two faces. It has the positive face and the negative face. If you look at the Christian Bible, again, we're not Christian, you'll notice the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are kind of starkly different. In one, there's the wrath of God, which is really karma. And um, it's really a lot of it is about karma. When, you know, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, it was really karmic law. You know, don't kill your neighbor. You know, don't do this. Don't do that. That's not really divine wisdom. But I mean, it, obviously, it's good to, to know these things. But people were so primitive. A lot of people were so primitive back then that you had to spell it out for them. Now, when you reach a certain state of consciousness, not really that high even, you're not going to go out and, and kill your neighbor for no good reason. Um, because it's against your nature. But back then, evidently, they had to spell it out in detail. And they had to create all this fear. Or I shouldn't say they had to, but they decided, certain people decided to create fear to try to keep people in line. <laughs> you know? behave yourselves this is all this isn't really spirituality it's morality i guess and morality is good i mean you can't have a society where everybody's killing each other um but this has nothing to do with god really and people say it's god's law well yeah it's karmic law so it's at a relatively low state is it necessary well yeah i mean we don't but it's not the answer to, if one follows karmic law to the best of their ability, um, 
it's certainly going to be easier, but it's still going to, you're still looking at all these incarnations. So all the things that people do, you know, they do the hokey pokey, they sing to God, they praise God, they write music for God, they dance for God, they feed the poor for God, they do all these things. And I'm not saying it's not noble, but until man brings his awareness, consciousness, into these various planes and reaches God, he's just playing a game of reincarnation and karma. Now, you might say, like, why is this so? Well, you know, you can talk about something, you can think about something, you can feel something, you can imagine something, but it's not the same as doing it. And if you truly love God, and, and you love the highest God, we call it in Vardhar Kihire, and you truly want truth, which most people don't want, they say they want it, but they don't want it, then you have to have the your own personal experiences. And ultimately, you have to establish yourself in these high worlds. And these are worlds. These are planes of existence that are far greater than the physical or the astral or any of the lower psychic planes. Now, for a lot of people, this is a daunting and scary thing and they run away as quick as their little feet can carry them. And I have no problem with that. Because like I said, it takes a bold, adventurous, brave person to even entertain the idea that they're going to work toward this direction. But, you know, the question is, well, what what alternative does the individual have? Well, they have an alternative, which is the tried, the, the thing that most people do initially, which is karma and reincarnation. So... You know, I wish I could say that there's an instant, oh gee, this is so funny, instant enlightenment. I remember seeing an ad on the internet, I, I really laughed my head off. Um, this lady was a psychic, I guess, and she was advertising on one of these um, websites, you know, that took different psychics and, and different new age people and, and had gave them space to advertise. I guess she paid X number of dollars a month or whatever it was. And I think it was titled something like Instant Enlightenment. And I think what she said in the ad was very, pretty funny. It was fine, really hysterical. Serious. It was serious, though. Uh, she was charging, I, think, I can't remember what it was, a hundred and, I it was $140 or something like that. It was like an hour session or 45-minute session. And she says uh, something like, there's no need to meditate. There's no need to struggle. There's no need to read books. You know, just, just send me, uh, the, basically send me the money and we'll get on the phone and within 15 minutes, you'll receive instant enlightenment. You know. <laughs> you know, um, there's a sucker born every minute. Now here's a lady who's obviously from reading her ad is um, probably somewhere in the astral, not even the mid-astral or high astral in consciousness, and she's uh, selling instant enlightenment. Really bad idea. There's a lot of karma generated from doing stuff like that. Um, really bad idea, I think, in my opinion. But I suppose it might be wor it might be working. I don't know. I don't know how well the ad worked. But I found it rather amusing that somebody's going to, in 15 minutes, they're going to get instant enlightenment. You have to wonder where she's going to take them to in <laughs> 15 minutes or to a half hour or whatever it is. Um, but, yeah, you know, I wish I, you know, it's like we're in this micro, microwave popcorn TV dinner canned good culture. And um, people... The people that are lazy, the masses, they really just want something to make their lives more fun or better or entertain. They want to be entertained and all this. And that's fine. 
But um, I'm not a clown, although sometimes I get, I can be a clown at times just for fun. You never know it listening to me. But um, yeah, that's not something that really, <laughs> it's just kind of silly. But it's a, it's a struggle. And um, I wish I could say that it's easy and all of that. But it can be done. And it can be done in a way where the individual proves it for themselves through their own personal experiences. That's the only way to do this. You know, when most people, when they're born, they have a certain state of consciousness, which they've reached for many lifetimes and various karma, reincarnation and all of these experiences but they've reached this certain state of consciousness. They're born into that consciousness, generally. And then they go through life, they have all these experiences, and it appears that they're making all this motion. You know, they're going through school, and they're, who knows, all this career and relationships, and if they get married, etc., etc., etc. And most people die, or translate. I call it trans, we call it translation in Vardenkar. But they they translate or die to, in the grave. You know, they go to the grave, so, so to speak. And, and um, they don't really go to the grave. But when on their deathbed, when they finally translate, their consciousness hasn't changed. It's the same consciousness that they started with. It's really weird. It's kind of sad. So yeah, they learned how to be a really good lawyer and they studied law and they got married and had four kids and all this stuff. But their actual consciousness, their state of consciousness has not really changed. You see this over and over again in life. Especially, well, with myself, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I was going to say blessed, but it's not really a blessing. I've had the ability to, um, through working hard at it, had the ability to see into my own past lives and, and frankly, sometimes the past lives of other people with permission in most cases. And um, it's pretty interesting. It's not it's not the goal of Vardenkar to see your past lives. Um, it's actually not that all that difficult, but it's can be a little dangerous. It can be very dangerous because it can be sh a real shocker. It can throw you out of balance because you're going to find, if you're like most people, you've had a lot of lives and some of them have been really, really traumatic. You know how, you know how people get tra traumatized if they're in a war, or if they've been physically assaulted, or you know all kinds of trauma that creates engrams, these packets of of energy that can be really unpleasant to deal with. So you have to be careful with with them. Um, past life recall um because there's a lot more than you think but you start to see these patterns and you start to see that people go through these various cycles and for example these so-called star seed people um a lot of them obviously have had lifetimes on more technologically advanced planets where there's more dna the brains are more advanced um you know, I mean, there's so many different interplanetary cultures in the past cultures, present cultures. Um, and so they they just want to go back to that planet. They consider that their home planet. And as if that's their home, you know, that's, that's where they'll be happy there. And it's really a karmic thing. Because they remember a time when they were more... Um, yeah, you know, no wars, no hunger, stuff like that. There are planets that are like that, or have been like that. And, uh, you know, where things are, um, I guess you could say just more pleasant, easier. But I always give the analogy of, even on Earth, I mean, even the Earth, just this little ball. This big ball with lots of water on it. You know, you can go to the worst um, war-torn country. Where everybody's running around with AK-47 and shooting at each other and killing each other and starvation and, you know, um, what they call a hellhole, I guess. And then you get on a 
helicopter and you fly to an airport and you go to Hawaii into a, a four-star hotel with room service and go to restaurants and lie on the beach in hammocks. And I mean, it's the difference would be quite dramatic. Another analogy would be you could go from being inside a dark, dingy, smelly cave, all walled up inside a cave, you know, for a long period of time, and then you finally get out and you're in this beautiful, beautiful country with flowers and trees and grass. And it would seem like paradise, you know, sunlight. You know, imagine sunlight if if you're used to this environment of darkness and dingy, damp, cold cave going into an environment where there's sunlight and lakes and birds and singing um, birds singing and animals and just there'd be a, a, a contrast, a stark contrast. Well, that's just the earth. You know, that's a very simple, primitive example. When you start getting into these higher planes, the differences are um, much, I mean, not even comparable. So it's a, vi- it's a jungle out there. It's very easy to be fooled by illusion, into thinking that you've made it, that you finally made it. This is it. I've reached the ultimate state of consciousness and I can just stay here for eternity. Um, But there's some people that will settle for some pretty, you know, limited um, things because that's where their consciousness is at at that moment in their lives. And they will settle for, you know, going to another planet in a future life and living there with more DNA or they'll settle for, you know, going from poverty to being wealthy or, or some people settle for almost anything. They'll settle for cable TV. Um, but, um, and some people just don't know better. You know, it's, we've been, the human race has been lied to over and over and over again. But it's funny when people are offered truth, they usually recoil and sometimes they will viciously attack it. And it's um, never give people something they don't want. And it's their right to do what they please with that. And so, you know, we've been doing this universal work now for, I don't know, I guess, uh, well, I became the Living Barden Master like seven years ago. This is 2020. It's been very difficult. It still is difficult. Very difficult job. Um, I'm certainly not the best, greatest Varden master ever. Um, usually, you know, the, the person that gets the position is sort of like the rookie. And there are masters, Varden masters that are far um, older and wiser than me in, this, in, the, in the physical and other planes. But... Um, I've seen a lot of things, and I'm still learning. And it's a matter of, a lot of it is desire and humility. And the negative power will try to stop anyone who wants to free themselves and reach self-realization and God-realization. To get out of the wheel of 84 and reach these states where they go beyond matter, energy, space, and time into these pure, the pure positive God worlds, what's known as the pure positive God worlds. There's a chart on the Vardenkar website, and um, if you're interested in taking a look at it, it's uh, V-A-R-D-A-N-K-A-R dot com. There's a couple charts. They're basically, one is a simplified version, the other's a little more detailed but it shows some of the a very rough sketch of the various planes ranging from the physical up through the astral and the causal and the mental, the etheric, the soul plane. There's a dividing line between the etheric, and I was mentioning this before, you reach the void, what's called the great void. It's this area of darkness, and it's um, a lot of energy. A lot of paths, a lot of gurus and people, well, not all of them reach that this that high level, but they think that they've reached God realization. And there's a void between each of the planes, but it's not the great void. 
Um, once you pass that great void, you reach the soul plane, which is the first of the pure positive God worlds. And um, you're now beyond matter, energy, space, and time. And you're greeted by Satnam, who's the lord of that region. He's the first true manifestation of God, the Hure. And there are various lords for these different planes. They're not God, they're lords. Um, there's infinite states of consciousness. But it's very important to understand that this dividing line is extremely important. It marks the difference between the worlds of illusion and the worlds of reality, the, the pure positive God worlds. One soul has dropped all these bodies. See, all the lower planes, the physical, astral, causal, mental, and etheric planes, they all have bodies that are used to interact in these negative planes. So we obviously have a physical body. We also have an astral body. A lot of people confuse the astral body for soul. We have a causal body. It's the seed body. It's the area of memory. It stores a lot of our past lives. But it's a body. It's finite. But it lasts a lot longer than the astral, and the astral lasts a lot longer than the physical. We have a mental body, which is, and these correspond to the different planes that I mentioned. And then finally, we have this etheric body, which is a very, very fine sheath that surrounds soul. It's a very, it's like the subconscious, it's the primitive mind. It's the last barrier that separates soul from its, um, it's the last filter that, that's placed around soul. So these are like Russian dolls, one inside the other, and then one inside that, and one inside that. So soul is extremely impeded by all these bodies, you see, because the vibrations are so low in the physical compared to soul's true home, you see. And so we're not, we're not in, we're in enemy territory, basically. Soul is in enemy territory. So the idea, which can be achieved, um is to get beyond these lower bodies, lower planes, by moving oneself in consciousness by their own volition, volition into these higher states and having those experiences as soul. Soul has a 360-degree viewpoint. It's a, it's a particle of awareness. It's a point of awareness. And it doesn't require a mind, you see. It knows who's seeing, knowing, and being. You see, I am, therefore I am. The mind and the lower bodies are constantly analyzing their machines. They are very, very, very complicated machines. Soul is the only part of us that's eternal. It's the only part of us that God is interested in. Now, the lower bodies have a purpose. Um, initially, they give soul experiences, but ultimately... In order to serve in the lower planes as a conscious co-worker with God, we use them as tools. As as the great Tibetan Varden Master Rebbe Zartarza said, the mind makes a, a, um, a good servant, but a very poor master. And so all these tools, all these bodies, the physical body, the astral body, etc., they're all there to serve as vehicles for soul, so that soul can do whatever universal work it needs to do in the lower planes. But we have to become conscious co-workers. You see, until we become conscious co-workers, we're playing a game. You see, we're, we're not conscious, so we're just doing what we think is the right thing to do. You see, we're not coming from the proper state of consciousness. And so we're subject to karma and reincarnation. So it's all about awareness, consciousness. So the bottom line is this whole idea that we, we're in one place at a time is not actually true. 
we're actually on all of these different planes at the same time. But to be aware of that's another story. And so a true Varden master is not stuck in one particular plane. And so you'll find if you practice the path long enough, and some are better at it than others and faster at it than others, you'll find eventually, after, once you've gotten used to leaving your body and having these diff various experiences on these various planes, you begin to realize that you can operate on more than one plane at a time, that it's not as big a deal as it sounds. So you can be in the physical, for example, and at the same time, you're dwelling in these in one of the higher planes, or maybe more than one, and so it's by location. And now you can use the physical body as a vehicle. So you may be speaking to somebody, or you may be writing, or, or painting, or doing something, but at the same time, you're dwelling in these pure positive God worlds, and so now you're a channel for this Varden, this Holy Spirit, but you're a pure and open channel, you see. And you declare yourself a, a channel for the Varden, the Huri, and the Margatma. Or the, the Margatma is the highest state of consciousness, the universal consciousness that's the personification of God, because God is at such a high level of vibration that you see it it's um it's the personalized version of that now we will in time whether it's this lifetime or another lifetime we will go into those those the, and actually reach touch the hem of God's robe God, figuratively of course God doesn't have a robe God is not a man or a woman but we will reach into the ocean of love and mercy the twelfth plane, and we will have the experience of the Hure, God realization. You see, that's the difference between this Vardenkar and religion and metaphysics. Metaphysics and religion and philosophy and all of these man made things, which contain some truth mixed with illusion, they all make promises. They promise man all of these benefits and all these things. But they can't really truly deliver to bring the individual into these God states. They can't because they're not working from that level. And so they bring man more reincarnation and karma. So I wanted to thank you for listening. Baraka Bashad, may the blessings be.